Thanks, John, and thanks everyone for this invitation. It was a huge pleasure to work with John and the rest of you last year when we celebrated George Eliot's bicentenary. And I was just spending quite a lot of this year thinking, thank goodness she was born in 1819, not 1820. That would have been a bit of a nightmare. Um, it's a huge honour and it's very humbling to be giving this lecture, following in some extraordinary footsteps of some very illustrious previous lecturers, some of whom are in the audience today. And it's a particular pleasure to be giving this lecture as the fellowship approaches its 90th anniversary. It's a massive achievement and it owes a lot to your devotion and dedication to supporting Elliot and Elliot studies over the years. And many people have great cause to be enormously grateful to John and, and indeed to the rest of you. Um, so I've, I've kind of had a relationship with George Elliot for quite a long time. Um, I'm from the West Midlands rather than Nuneaton, but um, I do remember very distinctly reading a, mill, a very abridged version, I think of the Mill on the Floss at my local library, which still, thank goodness, is in existence. I still remember the cover of it and being very enthralled by Elliot and the delight of growing up alongside her, knowing that she was from the Midlands too, was, was terrific. And I've been spending quite a lot of time, I suppose she's been in each of the books I've written and she's very much at the centre of the current research I'm doing. So part of that is, is informing part of the lecture I'm giving today. As you'll know, the fellowship's founder, Mr A.F. Cross, deliberately chose fellowship as a term that best described his aspirations for this new group and not society for which there are lots of literary precedents. As Kathleen Adams wrote in 2000, fellowship was his own personal choice of title since its meaning for him seemed to be most suited to admirers of a woman who still had a message for present and future generations. So there's clearly something inherent in that term that conveyed an enduring quality suitable for maintaining Eliot's name. Kathleen Adams' own history of the fellowship chose, chooses a different collective noun in its title, a community of interest, which has echoes of a more actively demanding community of practice, and which again emphasises a form of collective responsibility. Society perhaps comes to seem a slightly effete term and not quite up to the aspirations of George Eliot's readers. What was never in question was that the fellowship be termed a network, Though many of us now belong to a number of networks, usually professional and often using online media as their modes of communication. So what I want to think about today is the concept of the network, which I guess in the title should really have quotation marks around it, alongside other collective nouns and how they work in terms of thinking about Eliot's contemporary readers. And I'll use the example of Adam B to examine how a group of readers begins to evolve and what mechan mechanisms are behind that novel's great popular as well as its critical success. So essentially I'm using Adam B as an exemplar of how a Victorian reading audience gets created. So that's the bulk of the lecture really, just thinking about Adam Bede and its, and its moment of publication and shortly afterwards. And as a coder, I'll go on to think about the usefulness of the concept of the network for Victorian and modern readers and scholars, and how it works alongside other nouns of collective activity and identity in Eliot's work. So I think I'm gonna be speaking for about 40 minutes. I hope it's not longer than that. And um, I can't see what you're doing. I'm looking at my, my lecture. So if you want to go and have a cup of tea or play with your phone, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so Adam Bede was published on the 1st of February. It's actually published rather later than it should have been. It was meant to have been published months earlier, but it had been held up by Edward Bulwer-Lytton's Bulwer tardiness in correcting the proofs of his four volume novel, What Will He Do With It? Written whilst he was Secretary of State for the Colonies. The thought of Dominic Robb coming out of the novel is a chilling one, so I'm gonna pass over on pretty quickly. <laughs> Before Adam Bede's publication, Elliot Lewis and John Blackwood were trying to secure the terms of its success by arranging appropriate marketing and critical negotiations. At this point, of course, Elliot, sorry, Lewis was by far the more experienced writer of the pair, and he was crucial in negotiating the terms of publication for Elliot's work with the Blackwoods, by then a very well established company who published leading writers, including Margaret Oliphant and Anthony Trollope, and whose periodical Blackwoods Edinburgh magazine, which is very familiar to all of us, was founded in 1817. But just as crucial for Elliot was John Blackwood's own generous concern for his nervous and insecure writer and the affability and shrewdness he applied in helping to negotiate the tough business of publishing for her. One immediate issue to be faced was the predominant position of Moody's circulating library in determining work's success. 
Readers had been borrowing books from Moody since 1842, but the company's move to Oxford Street in 1851 had massively increased its influence and significance, which often extended to the content of the books it lent. In 1858, according to Judith Flanders, Moody's bought 100,000 new books, a figure which nearly doubled to 180,000 three years later. Mindful of Moody's power, Eliot had queried anxiously why Moody has almost always left the CS, Seeds of Clerical Life, out of his advertised list, although he puts in very trashy and obscure books. I hope it is nothing more than chance. With Adam Bede, Moody was trying to drive a very hard bargain, initially threatening to take only 50 copies, but finally succumbing, to use John Blackwood's term, to taking 500 at our terms of 10% off sales, to which I think he's entitled when he takes so large a number. Blackwood was finally satisfied with Moody's decision, not least because, as he wrote to Lewis, he understood the lender's caution. As I have often explained before, he wrote, I felt distinctly that by clerical scenes, a reputation with readers and men of letters was made, but not a public general reputation. When the reviews begin to appear and people who've read Adam Bede begin to talk about it, the movement will take place. So we can see here Blackwood's careful attention to the mechanics of popularity, the need to create an audience that would communicate its enthusiasm, the need to gauge audiences and to try to effect the best response. Blackwood's assessment, of course, proved correct, not least because he was, as he said, sending copies to the press in all directions. And the press, as we'll see, was crucial in achieving the novel's reputation. Blackwood's publicity and marketing work was perhaps more tricky with Adam Bede than other novels he'd worked on. And as the year progressed, Blackwood and Elliot discovered how the market responded to this new work, and indeed how she began to create a market for a new type of thoughtfully engaged, serious fiction that re reviewers came to recognise in Adam Bede. As they awaited its publication, Blackwood and Elliot discussed their expectations for the novel in terms of its popularity a word which crops up throughout the year in their discussions of her work and that of her contemporaries, including Darwin, whose On the Origin of Species came out in November and almost immediately sold out its first edition. Blackwood wrote that Adam Bede can never come under the class of popular, agreeable stories. Though those who love power, real humour and true natural description will stand by the sturdy carpenter. And Eliot described her hope for the novel in these terms. I perceive that I have not the characteristics of the popular author, and yet I am much in need of the warmly expressed sympathy which only popularity can win. So there's a distinction here in their views of the popularity of the agreeable, non-threatening writer of popular fiction and a deeper popularity, which Eliot articulates, the love of the people, which is rather a characteristic of the affection gained by writing than a generic measure of the fiction itself. We can see an interesting distinction, I think, between the person of the author and the writing. Blackwood writes about the characteristics of Adam Bede, Eliot writes about herself. So as the year progressed, Blackwood's use of the term popularity shifted, as the success of Adam Bede began to redefine what a popular novel looked like, and arguably the concept of popularity itself. With this novel, Eliot takes Victorian fiction into a new phase of psychological complexity, via a deeply moral, realistic aesthetic and an ambitious reading practice that demanded not only serious critical attention, but a degree of committed, empathetic investment. In the novel's early reviews, we can see how out of very familiar materials, she was perceived to be developing a new mode of fiction. As literary professionals, Elliot and Lewis were avidly concerned with how Adam Bede might be reviewed by whom and how it would fare alongside more overtly popular novels. An early review from the Statesman disgusted and disheartened Lewis as he wrote, it was laudatory throughout, but the kind of laudation was fatal. The nincompoop couldn't see the distinction between Adam and the mass of novels he's been reading. Elliot herself was anxious about too damnatory praise from ignorant journalists. And she charged Blackwood with making sure that no hackneyed puffing phrase be tacked to her book in advertising columns. She goes on in a letter of 25th of February, one sees such phrases garnishing every other advertisement of the popular publisher Hurst and Blackett's trash. Surely no being above the rank of an idiot can have his inclination coerced by them. 
and it would gall me as much as any trifle could to see my book recommended by such an authority as the writer in Bell's Weekly Messenger, who doesn't know how to write decent English. Elliot may well then have been dismayed at the first review of Adam Bede, which appeared in the John Bull in Britannia. It was less than glowing, made no mention at all of its hero, and concentrated entirely on Hetty's attractions as a popular heroine. However, Adam Bede did go on to become the most widely reviewed novel of the year and to receive due recognition of its innovations, its complexity and its new demands on readers. Reviews appeared throughout the year in national and regional publications and were quick to acknowledge Adam Bede's success. Rather differently to now, of course, when reviews come out immediately on a novel's um, appearance, reviews were still appearing in the autumn. But as early as the 26th of February, the Saturday Review was advising that persons who only read one novel a year, and it is seldom that more than one really good novel is published in a year, may venture to make their selection and read Adam Bede. And in the Edinburgh Review, and anonymous, an anonymous Caroline Norton judged that the novelist has every reason to feel proud that the universal question in men's mouths in the pause between topics of war and politics is, have you read Adam Bede? Like the war for Italian independence, that year's general election and voting reform, Adam B took its place as one of the key events of 1859. And the person of Adam himself partly enables this identification with the contemporary moment through reviewers welcome, welcoming him as no ideal creation, no figment of a writer's brain, as one of ourselves, lighting up some English hearth and home for truly English is our friend Adam. And for Geraldine Dewsbury in the Athenaeum, Adam revealed the secret of the substantial worth of England, the secret of her strength. It is not the number of men and women with brilliant reputations and lyrically recognised name and fame that makes the enduring prosperity of a nation, but it lies in the amount of worth that is unrecognised, that remains dumb and unconscious of itself, not clever, but with a certain honest stupidity that understands nothing but doing its best and doing its work without shirking any portion of it. Adam was welcomed, Caroline Norton wrote, as a true model of the noble, simple, self-reliant type to be found, as Wordsworth's lines in the epigraph to this remarkable novel expresses it, among nature's unambitious underwood and flowers that prosper in the shade. As these lines from Wordsworth's The Excursion suggest, the recognition of the value of an unambitious, unselfconscious life was not a new phenomenon. But it was to achieve greater political and social purchase in 1859, and arguably Adam Bede helped prepare the audience for Samuel Smiles's, Samuel Smiles's self-help, which appeared in November. As the Glasgow Herald stated, Adam Bede had the hands of a carpenter and the head of a gentleman. So the Englishness of the novel itself begins to form a collective readerly identity, and it's manifest too in Adam Bede's rural setting, which is coterminous with the past that Eliot conjures up so effectively, and which reviewers not responded to with great nostalgia. After congratulating the male novelist, a rare man of genius in a world dominated by female novelists for his ability to write a work that is in keeping with the actual world, the Economist's reviewer states that after a course of the feverish self-critical posted up to the latest dates novels of the present day, reading Adam Bede is like paying a visit from town to the open hillsides, pure air and broad sunshine of the country, which it describes. The review echoes a private letter that is quite a famous letter now, which you might have read, that Jane Walsh Carlyle wrote to the author of Adam Bede, whose identity at that time she didn't know saying that reading the novel was as good as going into the country for one's health, that it was like a visit to her childhood home of Scotland, minus the fatigues of the long journey and the grief of seeing old friends grow old and places that knew me, know me no more. I could fancy in reading it to be seeing and hearing once again a crystal clear musical Scotch stream, such as I long to lie down beside and cry out for gladness and sadness after long stifling sojourn in the south, where there is no water but what is stagnant or muddy. The rural setting of the novel blends with the attractiveness of its characters to achieve a harmonious pattern that, that surprises reviewers into finding those humble characters 
including farmers and blacksmiths, sympathetic realities, rather than mere lay figures, as the Saturday Review puts it, on which authors hang their old shooting jackets while they walk around in an evening dress smirking and pointing out how jolly and genial they are with their own old clothes. The Saturday Review instructs its readers whilst describing what it finds. It's universally agreed by reviewers that this is a very cohesive novel where event and incidents such as are found in the third volume actually intrude on the symbiotic reflectiveness, setting and characters of the novel. The person who takes up most attention in the reviews is unquestionably Mrs Poyser. For the times she is the pivot on which the plot revolves, the chorus who is continually intervening. She is for most reviewers a comic character with the times comparing her to Daniel, sorry, to, to Dickens's Sam Weller, Mrs Gamp or Mrs Nickleby. But whilst she is someone whom more recent critics are more likely to overlook in their attention to other figures, every single contemporary review contains its favourite nugget of Mrs Poyser's eminently quotable wisdom. The Edinburgh Review indeed to devotes six long pages to her sayings. Indeed, her ability to be quoted both in reviews and by other characters in the novel itself is her preeminent feature and function. As the Times writes, her wisdom is always coming out, either spoken by herself or quoted by somebody else or mentioned by the author. And in this, the reviews thus enact and perpetuate Mrs Poyser's primary role. And in doing so, they acknowledge a keystone of Eliot's writing in that the quotation works by establishing and confirming familiarity with something that pre-exists. The act of quoting then enables a sympathetic recognition of a common viewpoint or shared experience both within and then beyond the parameters of the novel. The reviewer Anne Mosley wonders, do any, people, any two people ever talk three minutes over this story without quoting with a particularly sly relish the definition of Mr. Ride's style of preaching as though it met some case very near home, which out of respect or delicacy, they will not further indicate. And this is the, the quote of Mrs. Poyser that she's referring to. She said, Mr. Owen was like a good meal of victual. You were the better for him without thinking on it. And Mr. Ride was like a dose of physic. He gripped and worried you. And after all, he left you much the same. So the subject of a dull sermon may indeed have been a general one. But the quote makes it go home, as Mosey puts it, to each individual's business and bosom. And speaker and listener are thus both enabled, sorry, enabled both to build a link with their fellows through the bridge of the quotation, and also tacitly to acknowledge the emotional affect of the novel as grounded in its recognition and invoking of something already existing in the past, in the memory, the quotation, which must be known in order to be quoted in order to achieve its ends in the present. So Mrs Poyser is absolutely at the heart of the novel's impact on, and its amalgamation of, its readers. This is, in Anne Mosley's perceptive review, intrinsic to the success of a novel which has found its way, as she puts it, into hands indifferent to all previous fiction, to readers who welcome it as the voice of their own experience, in a sense no other book has ever been. Quotation, both within the novel and in reviews, acts out Mrs Poyser's function as the heart of Hayslope's community in cementing a communal set of values which might even displace the centrality of the church through the novel's well-directed morals. The highlight of Mrs Poyser's fame was her being cited in the House of Commons on the 8th of March, where she was quoted by the Liberal MP Charles Buxton in a debate on the Charles et Georges affair. Et George affair. The Charles Georges was um, a French ship which was alleged to be involved in the slave trade. Buxton suggested that the Earl of Malmesbury, now that the case could be seen as a whole, would wish that his conduct, as the farmer's wife said in Adam Bede, could be hatched over again and hatched different. As the Blackwoods Review noted, this cemented Mrs Poyser's position amongst British worthies. It also extended the novel's initial reach and confirmed in its affirmation and through retrospection, which is fundamental to the act of quotation, the way in which the novel worked primarily through the medium of the past, which was both the novel's subject matter and its creative vehicle. 
Mrs. Poyser epitomises the country scenes in Adam Bede, looked back upon with an almost passionate tenderness, and so the senses ached for the genial old home, Mosley wrote, which is the end point of more than one readerly engagement with Adam Bede. Home, the past, country scenes, and thoughts which have been lying half developed and struggling for expression in many minds are the heart of the novel's success in 1859. And Anne Mosley's review is a very sensitive and very good one, I think. So through reviews, readers who already share an identity through the site of the review, through the specific publication that they're reading, become joined with other groups, whether those groups have read or will go on to read the novel or not. Huge chunks of quotations in 19th century reviews might give an impression of having read the novel in question, and at least they might give private grounds for a conversation or recognition of a passing reference, which themselves go on to forge further links. One such is the mention of Adam in a fictional series called Journey to the North in the English Woman's Journal, which was published, of course, by some of Elliot's friends in September. So in this, this story, this fictionalised travel narrative, we read, we stopped to see Barden Tower in Yorkshire, which was being repaired, and there, whistling and planing, was a carpenter. Oh, how like Adam Bede, whispered A, clutching my arm convulsively. As I knew A's peculiar weakness for that individual and feared there might be a previous diner, I hurried her off. Anyone fo following parliamentary discussions might have heard reference to Mrs Poyser, and Buxton wasn't the only politician to have read the novel. Blackwood sent Elliot a note that he'd received from Bulwer Lytton, praising Adam Bede's exquisite touches of beauty in the conception of the human character, and calling it one of the very ablest works of fiction I've read for years. By the end of the summer, by which point, of course, Elliot's own identity was known, Adam Bede was being read throughout the UK and Europe. Queen Victoria initially read the novel for herself and subsequently to her husband as he lay ill in bed in October, and she wrote to her daughter in Germany, Dear Papa was much amused and interested by Adam Bede, which I'm delighted to read a second time. There is such knowledge of human nature, such truth in the characters. I like to trace a likeness to the dear Highlanders in Adam and also in Elizabeth and Mrs Poyser. I'm sure it is only a true picture of what, const of what constantly and very naturally happens. This is an unusually tolerant view of Hetty's situation. Returning from a trip to see his sons in Switzerland, Lewis wrote, to report to Blackwood that Paris is in a fever about Adam Bede. Even at Hofwell, five miles from Bern, with only half a dozen English boys, I heard of it. For on telling my son, my second son, I'd brought him a novel, all three shouted, is it Adam Bede? And Elliot and Lewis had returned from Europe to find a generous letter from Dickens, who, having determined to wait until I could write to you in person, now took the opportunity to address Elliot as my dear madam and to tell her how Adam Bede has taken its place among the actual experiences and endurances of my life. And in August, while traveling through the small Welsh town of Penmyn Moor, Lewis notes in his journal that even at this small station, we find a lady reading Adam Bede. Wherever we go, we see people reading it. So through judicious reviewing, the novel had gained significant publicity, but as now, its fame and popularity received a boost from book clubs and from more formal institutions. An article in the National Review on books of the quarter suitable for reading societies said that the novel evinces a deeper and wider genius than any novel we've read for years, with a touch of delicacy in the quiet descriptions that often reminds us of Goethe and great masculine vigour of imagination. The author combines a range of observation, an insight into character and a humorous power which render his production a really lasting work of art. And the era notes that all circulating libraries and book clubs may congratulate themselves on so brilliant an addition to their lists. It became so popular that in October, 10 copies of Adam Bede were amongst a number of books stolen from a bookseller in New Bond Street. Adam Bede enthralled, comforted, and challenged readers' expectations. And as one review notes, there is neither a monster, a villain, nor a hero in it, according to the usual sense. Hailed as an assured success by the summer, Adam Bede was constructing what we might think of as a national network of readers, a complex configuration which crossed class boundaries as well as geographical ones. And on the 1st of June, George Howard, the Earl of Carlisle, 
gave a speech at the opening of the new hall of the Saddleworth Mechanics and Literary Institute. He praised the wholesomeness of the enterprise, was particularly glad to encourage reading amongst the working classes, and interestingly asserted the place of fiction in their busy working lives. He said, this is in the report of his speech, the mind cannot always remain on the full stretch, and I should regret very much any such pedantic and very rigorous regulations as would exclude books which the working classes might like to peruse on long winter evenings. Such wholesome works of fiction and entertainment, for instance, as Mary Barton, and one more recently published, which is named Adam Bede. And I earnestly exhort everyone I now address, though it is a novel, to read the latter, for it contains some of the most, some of the deepest searchings and appeals to the higher instincts of our nature that it ever fell to my lot to come across. With these words, George Howard is not only recommending an enlightening book to the working classes whom he addresses, but sharing his own reading experience with them, addressing them as equals in the field of literature, as potential co-readers, members of the same audience, and subject to the same range of experiences. It's both a covert instruction and an invitation which begins to break down barriers between readers and thus to fulfil Eliot's ambitions for her work. During a year when the government was painstakingly seeking ways to redefine political community and constituencies, and nations were reconfiguring boundaries and alliances. The arts provided the grounds for other alliances to be formed and groups to be defined. Audiences and consumers of culture created configurations along the lines of shared tastes, experiences and responses, which might, as in theatrical audiences, be class-based or be far more disparate, such as those groups across Britain who read and enjoyed Adam Bede. So cultural experiences and literary text provide modes nodes rather of interconnection which might either coincide with or completely override more politically driven or economically determined configurations. What's apparent however is that in a period which celebrated the notable individual there was also a pressing necessity to remap collective identities too and that the arts were one of the media within which the drawing of lines of affinity was taking place. But do these lines of affinity draw up a network? I've been intrigued for a while about this term and how it's applied to the Victorian period. I think it's particularly after reading a fantastic book which Mary Shannon published in 2015. It's called Dickens, Reynolds and Mayhew on Wellington Street, the print culture of a Victorian street, which some of you will know. It's a brilliant book about the extraordinary concentration of periodical offices and publishers around Wellington Street, which is a street that still exists in London between Strand and Covent Garden. And Mary's book asserts that Wellington Street is positioned at the heart of London's print networks, which themselves give rise to a networked way of working and socialising. It's a really eye-opening piece of work, a really good example of the ways in which cultural geography can really inform um, our work in literature. I'm not in any way seeking to question what Mary discovers and argues about the lives and work that are centred around this street, but I am very intrigued about the idea of the network and its applicability to the 19th century and how far the largely professional meanings of the term that we've produced quite recently can be applied to the Victorians. According to the OED, the first, the use of network to mean an interconnected group of people or an organisation was first coined in 1947, which is just seven years after networking was used to describe new possibilities for television. The OD quotes, television, now that a practicable means of networking has been developed, has been supplied with the final implement necessary for the creation of what will eventually be a nationwide service. Now things may of course exist before the term for them is evolved. The old boy network was surely present before the term was coined in 1959 and even before the term old boy to signify a former pupil at a school was first used in the title of Tom Brown's school boys by an old boy, school days by an old boy in 1857. But in the mid, in, in the mid 19th century, network would have signified either something made a work in which threads, wires or similar materials are arranged in the fashion of a net, especially a light fabric made of netted threads, or a piece of work having the form or construction of a net, a collection or arrangement of something or things resembling a net, 
or this saw quoted from the OED or something in nature that resembled a net like structures in animals or plants or a complex collection or system of rivers. So the root of the concept in the 19th century lies in something crafted and then in the metaphors that emerge from that work. And we can see these uses exemplified in Eliot's quite sparing use of the term. In the sad fortunes of the Reverend Amos Barton, Mrs Brick seems to have been given a network of wrinkles by age, as has Kester Bale in Adam Bede, the old man with the close leather cap and the network of wrinkles on his sun-browned face. Whereas Miss Rebecca Linnett's wrinkles and other features might be blurred through her veil, which is described as a Turnerian haze of network. The narrator of Adam Bede also describes a wire network window overlooking the garden at the Poises farm. Another network is physical, a network of black tram lines in Felix Holt. But most of Eliot's later uses of the term represent metaphorical uses or psychological applications of the term. Lush ponders the network of possible paths that Grand Court's actions might take. And in the same novel, Daniel Geronda experiences the printed words of a book as no more than a network through which he saw and heard everything as clearly as before, as he sits remembering his rescue of Myra. This is a full quotation. He sat up half the night, living again through the moments since he'd first discerned Myra on the river brink, with the, fur with the fresh and fresh vividness which belongs to emotive memory. When he took up a book to try and dull this urgency of inward vision, the printed words were no more than a network through which he saw and heard everything as clearly as before, saw not only the actual events of two hours, but possibilities of what had been and what might be, which those events were enough to feed with the warm blood of passionate hope and fear. The network here seems, if anything, to be impeding connection, and Gwendolyn, being forcibly courted by Grand Court, is likened to a fish about to be devoured. A fish honestly invited to come and be eaten has a clear course in declining, but how if it finds itself swimming against a net? And apart from the network, would she have dared at once to say anything decisive? Gwendolyn had not time to be clear on that point. And in Middlemarch, the network of Rosamond's cleverness traps Lydgate as money troubles and Rosamond's loss of her baby begin to overwhelm him. His superior knowledge and mental force, instead of being, as he'd imagined, a shrine to consult on all occasions, was simply set aside on every practical question. He had regarded Rosamond's cleverness as precisely of the receptive kind which became a woman. He was now beginning to find out what that cleverness was, what was the shape into which it had run as into a close network, aloof and independent, no one quicker than Rosamond, to see causes and effects which lay within the track of her own tastes and interests. It's one of the most chilling moments of the novel, I think. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the use of the word web is more prominent and often more promising in Eliot. The web is another natural image which has echoes in a made artifact, but one that may be made to encompass and connect. There are a few tangled webs but unlike in that phrase's source, Walter Scott's Marmion, where he writes, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive, Eliot's tangles are generated by the mental and emotional confusion, which for Daniel and Romola are the signs of confused human connection. After he meets his mother, Eliot writes of Daniel, when fatigue from the strangely various motion of the day at last sent her under to sleep, he remained undisturbed except by the morning dreams which came as a tangled web of yesterday's events and finally waked him with an image drawn by his pressing anxiety. And Romola sits weary in the darkness with a tangled web in her mind after her last meeting with her brother when she tries to make sense of his actions and those of Savonarola. But the web of course isn't a collective noun as such but rather denotes the actions needed to weave relations and situations which might trap an unwary young doctor, Middlemarch again. Young lovemaking, that gossamer web. The web itself is made of spontaneous beliefs and indefinable joys, yearnings of one life towards another, visions of completeness, indefinite trust. And Lydgate fell to spinning that web from his inward self with wonderful rapidity. As for Rosamond, she was in the water lilies, expanding wonderment at its own full of life. 
and she too was spinning industriously on the mutual web. It's interesting to reflect that networks and webs or the web have come to denote the structures that we largely live in now, especially this afternoon, in both our social <coughs> and our professional lives. Indeed, as I was searching through the Gutenberg versions of Eliot's works to find these keywords, they often crop, in the crop up in the footnotes about Gutenberg's websites <coughs> and in the acknowledgement that Professor Michael Hart initiated Project Gutenberg with only a loose network of volunteer support. So what word might we use then to connote the band of readers that Eliot created through her writing and that Blackwood gathered together through his work as a publisher? Band won't do. Eliot only uses it in Romola and then only to describe groups of belligerent men. So perhaps we have to go back to where we started and that term so carefully chosen by Mr. A.F. Cross, fellowship. Apart from a scattering of references in Daniel Deronda, this does not refer to any kind of exclusive academic role when used by Eliot, but rather the apotheosis of human life, often achieved through suffering or the greatest sympathy with suffering. One instance occurs in what I think is one of the most moving scenes in all of Eliot's writing, when Mrs. Bulstrode stands by her husband in his disgrace. She was at his side in mournful but unreproaching fellowship with shame and isolation. And of course, at the end of the mill on the floss, Maggie and Tom cling together in fatal fellowship. But throughout her work, fellowship is the form that relationships take at their most intense, often in spite of circumstances, such as Janet Dempster and the Reverend Tryon's fellowship in suffering. And in the mill on the floss, it's sorrow that raises the bare offices of humanity into a bond of loving fellowship. Romola is not the only novel in which simple human fellowship expressed itself as a strongly felt bond. Indeed, it becomes the bedrock of all relations in Eliot's later work, on which love, friendship, religious ardour, general bonhomie are all based. Marriage with Dorothea might seem a kind of risky fellowship to the narrator at the start of Middlemarch, but it's Mr. Casabon's lack of a sense of fellowship that dooms their marriage from the outset, and which ultimately leads Dorothea to fear binding herself to a fellowship from which she shrank. But conversely, it's through her need to express pitying fellowship rather than to rebuke Dor um, Rosamond that en enables her to learn the truth about Will's love for her. It's probably in Daniel Deronda that fellowship finds its climax in the novel's multiple manifestations of examples of how fellowship binds and grounds both collective and individual identity. Deronda himself is one of the rarer sort who presently see their own frustrated claim as one among a myriad, the inexorable sorrow takes the form of fellowship and makes the imagination tender. Increasingly, sorrow becomes the vehicle of that empathy that's Eliot's hallmark and of which fellowship is its manifestation. The sense of fellowship can thrill from the near to the distant and the fellowship with sorrow or with human travail, as Eliot puts it, traverses time too. It's finally firmly grounded for Daniel when he meets his mother and finds himself in the fellowship of your people, as his grandfather's friend Colonimus puts it. And as the narrator reports Daniel's in, Daniel himself is feeling later, it was as if he had found an added soul in finding his ancestry, his judgment no longer wandering in the mazes of impartial sympathy, but choosing with that partiality, which is man's best strength, the closer fellowship that makes sympathy practical, exchanging that bird's eye reasonableness, which soars to avoid preference and loses all sense of quality for the generous reasonableness of drawing shoulder to shoulder with men of like inheritance. In Dorothea and in Daniel, fellowship finally confirms their sense of self in a form of connectedness with their fellow men and women transmutes their benevolent desires into practical forms, and in both of their stories enables them to live beyond their own moment in their fellowship with the past and the future. The network, bound up with professionalism and enabled and limited by technology, is a vehicle for something more profound in Eliot's work and the experience of her readers. It's a means, not an end. And that experience finds itself in fellowship, surely a very appropriate term for the body of people still concerned to perpetuate Eliot's work still further.
and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. That was that was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, it really was. I I was particularly interested by those early examples of 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 the reviews because Victorians longer be much generous in the space that they gave to reviewing books than, mm -hmm. than we do than we manage now in our supposedly better educated times but i mean six pages about about mrs mrs boiser in, in one review is amazing it is i think i can't remember how long the review was it's probably about 25 30 pages so it's a, it's a substantial review in itself but but yes six pages of, of mrs poiser quotes it's quite quite extraordinary yeah. yeah um if you if those of you who would like to uh, ask a question uh, gail is happy to answer them or to have discussions but i think you will all need to unmute yourselves if you um wish to raise a point or you can put it in the chat i mean, we've got my, my colleague mary morrissey who's very very kindly um here to help john and i negotiate and navigate through through Zoom. So Mary, what's the best thing to do? Is put people putting their hands up or putting questions in the chat? Or um, if they if they could just put in the chat that they have a question and then um John can take them one by one. John can invite them to ask the question then I think. Right. That um or if they just want to raise their hand on the screen, that might work either. We can keep an eye on raised okay. hands. Thank you. Uh, Joanna. Thank you, Gail. I found that absolutely fascinating in so many ways, uh, particularly as John has highlighted the, the frequency with which readers, um, uh, reviewers rather, focused on Mrs. Poyser. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seemed to me that what we know of the way Adam Bede was published, that, that Lewis and, and Blackwood and and Elliot herself worked in a way it, as a kind of unit or a small network, a bit of the sort that Mary Shannon describes. Uh, they were they were geographically separated. Blackwood was in Edinburgh, and Lewis and, and Elliot were in, in London. But that they worked together to make this such a success. I wondered about scenes of clerical life. Um, where, as you said, Moody didn't take it. And the, the general reason is usually alleged because it only filled two volumes. And that was really Eliot's fault. She, she got frightened by Blackwood's uh, criticism of Janet's repentance, and so she stopped. Um, do you think if scenes had gone to three volumes and then had been more widely reviewed and taken up, there were any elements in that that might have made it as, you know, even some semblance of the popularity that Adam Bede, or what did she make a step change with, with Adam Bede, which is why it had this fantastic success? I think there's something, Scenes of Clerical Life, I think are, are I heard they look like an apprenticeship to me for, for Adam Bede in terms of working out particularly what she's saying about realism. Um, I think possibly people needed scenes of clerical life as that, as that stepping point into something that, that embeds that realist approach much more fundamentally than Adam Bede. Um, I also think there, there is my theory about Adam Bede, having read it alongside quite a lot of other novels that come out in 1859, is that she's, she's very cannily using some elements of popular fiction in Adam Bede, which don't, which she isn't doing in Scenes of Clerical Life. So I think Scenes of Clerical Life is, a, is a much, in some ways a much purer articulation of, of her interests. By the time she gets to Adam Bede, we've got a very well realised um, or two love triangles, really, which we're having to work through. We've got something very sensational at the end, which reviewers were often quite um, quite sniffy about, but nonetheless, it, it allows the novel to reach a happy ending, which scenes of clerical life don't generally have. Um, so I think there are ways in which Adam Bede is, is kind of carrying on the experimentation with realism and forms of fiction that she begins in scenes of clerical life, 
but there aren't the, the kind of popular elements that Adam Bede has, which enables that to be the great success that Scenes of Clerical Life weren't. I, but, but it's really interesting to think about the two volume versus three volume um, aspect of it, which I haven't thought about. So that's, um, and certainly would have affected Moody's willingness to take the volumes on, I think. You're absolutely right. Yes, but I think you're also right that when that letter uh, that I'm not a popular novelist, she shows in Adam B that she could become one, I think, for the reasons yeah. you just said, the sensationalism and the love triangles and so forth. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. And the love triangles are very interesting because in every every novel I've read from 1859, there is always um, a love triangle. There's the it's usually the girl who falls for the, the dissolute but handsome and dashing fella who's who's not a good bloke in the end, and she ends up with a with a the more solid, respectable Adam-like character. So we've got that in Adam Bede, but we've also got in Adam Bede the fact that it's Adam who falls for the girl who, who's not going to do the right thing and then goes and finds his love in Dinah. So it's quite an interesting kind of complication and twist on um on that that kind of trajectory. But what's also interesting, if I can switch on a bit about 1859 and, and other texts, is that there are, I found two or three novels which actually talk about realism in the way that Eliot's talking about it in chapter 17 in Adam Bede, where they're saying, you know, things don't have to be sugar-coated, we're just trying to tell things as they are, which is really fascinating. And it suggests to me that Scenes of Clerical Life was already having an impact on the writing of fiction, even really before Adam Bede became that well known. So. So that's that's very interesting, I think. Thank you, Jaron. John. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, sort of tentative question, Gail. Uh, what about the networks of readers in other countries? I'm thinking particularly of America in the first place. Mm -hmm. Do we have any sort of uh, understanding of that or is it possible to to trace any distinctive kind of networks uh, in the american readership or again in the european ones when tauchnitz's editions get underway i'm sure it would be i haven't done that but it'd be really right. interesting to find out i don't i don't know so much about how american networks which mm. i'm not using with quotation what's how that how they get constructed but it'd be, it would be fascinating and tauchnitz i think is is such an interesting understudied area yeah, mm. so I can't answer the question, but I think it's a you know they're great questions and um, would be really interesting to pursue. Well, I suppose in in the case of Daniel de Ronda, we all know that the, the a, a German rabbi in Frankfurt, David Kaufmann, published a pamphlet, George Eliot uh, uh, and Judaism in German. He's yeah. das Judentum, and um, I'm just thinking of networks. One rather, I think, comical episode is that. When Wagner and his wife Cosima Wagner were in London, Lewis presented Cosima Wagner with a copy of David Kaufmann's pamphlet. Uh, what he seemed to be unaware of, which we all know now, particularly from her diary, is that um, uh, Cosima Wagner was a rabid anti-Semite, so she wouldn't probably have taken very much to a, to a, a, a little work on George Eliot and, and Judaism. Um, but I suppose, in a way, Lewis was trying to extend the network of interest somehow um, by handing the book, that little work, on to mm -hmm. Wagner's. Indeed. But I don't know where that leads. Yeah. To a blind alley in that case, I think. Network is, is it's, a, it's a really interesting term and um, I know that Joanne's written about networks and um, I think in a special edition of RSVP, the Victorian Periodicals Review, a special issue about, about Victorian networks. And it's just, it's a very useful <clears throat> term, but I was just really interested to see how the Victorians used it or failed to use it in the ways in which we do. And it's very much bound up with, with technology, I think, as those initial uses of talking about the TV network um, demonstrated. Yes, I, I thought your your demonstration of how the work the, the word changes from the from the literal and the physical to the metaphorical in, in Eliot's own usage was was fascinating. Yeah, that was great. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Anyone else? 
anybody else with a, a question or a comment? I've got a bit of a question. Hello, yes, Margaret. Yes. Um, uh, we tend to think of the Victorians as prudish and narrow-minded and, you know, disapproving. Um, and our modern society is being much more open and things, and yet we've got a cancel culture now um, and writers are disapproved of, you know, because of something that's gone on in their private life or in their Twitter feed or things like that. I'm just fascinated to hear you talk about Queen Victoria reading it for a second time to her husband um, and knowing full well that it was a, a woman who uh, was living with a man she wasn't married to uh, who had written this story. And I was just wondering whether there was actually when it was discovered that it was a woman who'd written this book and she was living with a man she wasn't married to, was there any kind of backlash? Because every, all the reviews that you've read are all very positive about her work. Was there anything that was sort of backlash and sort of saying you shouldn't read work from this kind of person because she's not a good person? Well, it, it, it is a very interesting story and it does come out through the course of, of 1859. So Adam Bees is popularity is already well established before rumours start to circulate but there are, there are various stages through which that that story goes so Blackwood was quite um quite intent really on keeping keeping her identity secret he was really worried about what it would do to the reputation of the novel and to sales in fact when the story came out perhaps not surprisingly sales did really well so it actually gave the novel a bit of a boost um, so I suppose there's a kind of notoriety about Elliot which, which enabled that to happen. I think the only backlash I've really come up upon was in the pages of the Athenaeum, which is a very, it was quite a straight-laced kind of, um, um, I don't know to use the term right-wing, but it's, it's um, you know, a straight-laced, very establishment kind of um, uh, journal, which, which was, was very snide, very snippy about Elliot and the way in which, she, I suppose the, the way in which um, writers like Oliphant talked about her later as, as in, you know, writing in a very moral way whilst having this life which didn't seem to fit with what she was writing. So there's a certain snippiness, a snideness there. But um, I mean, the other thing that was happening, the other great literary scandal that was happening at the time was that John Payne Collier, a Shakespeare editor, was, was being proved to have faked some annotations in the Shakespeare folio and the Athenaeum was actually defending him. So there's a way in which they're sort of... Um, trying to um, condemn Eliot and, and support their own guy. There's two quite, quite big literary scandals going on at the time. But apart from that, um, the only other place where I found a, a real kind of anxiety about Eliot's reputation and what, what the outing of her identity might do is to women's um, literary reputations is, is in the things that Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Elizabeth Gaskell and I think Mrs. Um, Harriet Martin, I actually say in private letters, they're very anxious about the, the mismatch that they see between Eliot's public persona and her private identity, private activities. So there is an anxiety that, that she's going to bring women, serious women writers into disrepute, um, which is kind of both disappointing, but also um, entirely understandable. They might respond like that. So there's a great gamut of, of responses, you know, great generosity from people like Dickens, um, and actually even Mrs. Gaskell writes later to Elliot to congratulate her on the continuing success of Adam Bede. She'd written to her early and not knowing who Elliot was, but when she finds out Elliot's identity, she writes again. And um, Elliot writes back rather, rather stiffly. She's trying to be jovial, but she's rather stiff, I think. Um, so there's a, a great range of responses, but I don't think there's anything like the kind of cancel culture, if that, if that exists. Um, so it's not, there's not that kind of outright condemnation of her, which is interesting. As you say, the example of, Mrs. of um, Queen Victoria is particularly interesting, A, in carrying on reading Adam B, but B, not in, in not condemning Hetty and just thinking this is one of those things that happens, which, which as Victorian newspapers tell us did happen very frequently. But that's a great question, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Great answer, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think Jenny Harris has got a question. Um, I think I just reread Adam Bede oddly, and I didn't know that you'd be speaking about this. But besides 
for some reason, I was focusing on Toddy being a complete monster this time. I was also, I was startled at how many mentions of cows and cheese and butter yeah. there are. And I, I just, I just uh, did a quick search. Dinah even mentions cows and God in her first sermon, which I think is interesting. Um, and we all know, of course, that that George Eliot managed the dairy at her dad's, at her dad's place. But um, I was, what I'm, what I'm interested in is feminism and cheese. Mrs. Poyser at one point says that she provides one quarter of the income mm -hmm. from her dairy. Um, and it seems as if she's running her dairy in such a way that she's driven. There's so many mentions of, of her, or she mentions it, or other people, where she's constantly marketing herself in a way. And she seems driven to do it in the same way that Dinah is driven to sermonizing. Mm -hmm. And these these, this is why it's cheese and feminism. It's interesting to me that Eliot throws in this little soupçon of feminism. Both of, Adam Bead at the end tells Dinah that we can get married, but you can, you're, you can still preach. That's his caveat, it's his little caveat. Mm -hmm. And she's not so sure if that's going to work. Um, but Mrs. Poyser is certainly part of this of this income, of this family continuing there for many more generations. And I wondered what Victorian writers would have thought about that. I mean, we, I just wanna throw in one weird thing about Middlemarch. We, we know that many people disliked it, at least in Britain and America, they didn't seem to rock onto this, but they didn't like that Will Ladislaw did not have a job at the end of the novel. They thought it was, that was ridiculous, yeah. So it's it's in they are paying attention to these things, and I'm wondering what they would have thought that Mrs. Poyser is part of this economic engine, and that Dinah has been told that she could continue to preach if she wants her job, her occupation. Once we look beyond the middle class woman, most women in fiction will have worked. So I think Mrs. Poyser's activity isn't surprising I, mean, I think what's I mean it's really interesting that you you've talked about it because it does I mean when, when you as soon as you mention it it really does stand out so I think it's important because it gives her I wonder if it's kind of legitimizes this the, the language that she uses in some ways so her authority is underpinned by that financial authority that her work gives her and it enables her to have that voice particularly when she's speaking to the squire so brilliantly so I think right. that's that's very interesting to think about I think the other thing I'd say is that at this point there's when people are moving increasingly into the cities there is quite a, a big literature about about small holdings about um, practical instructions for how to how to run your own small holding how to try and survive on the land so it's kind of interesting that, that we've got these kind of quite practical instruction books alongside a, a novel, which is treating it as a form of um, kind of rural nostalgia, but which is something that's still very present. I suppose it's, we're thinking about it, you might be getting first or second generation people living in cities within whose family, there would be very immediate memories of this kind of very active domestic work by women and I, th I suppose Mrs Poise is interesting because we actually see more of her and Hetty's work on the farm than we do that of the men because we actually see the farmhouse and that's where their pastoral work takes place as opposed to the fields which we don't really right, go we don't get very anything often. Right. yeah right. that's really really interesting question Elliot and Cheese well, I, I just <laughs> want to point out one final thing um the reason I started to notice it is because until now, um, Mansfield Park and their cream cheeses at Southerton used to make me hungrier than anything, but now of course it's Adam Beats. So I just thought it was interesting. And, it, and I think it's because it's a fresh milk cheese that you can easily make and you can sell that same day, but it's strange that it shows up at Southerton as well. Mm -hmm. The housekeeper specialty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'd, I remember, I'm sure, some of you uh, here this afternoon will remember um, a talk from Catherine Hughes. Um, and when Catherine, when Catherine was doing research for her Victorians Undone, um, 
she decided in the interests of realism in her writing, uh, she was trying to work out why it was that um, Isaac's oldest son, Fred, Frederick Evans, and his daughter um, were both very anxious that this story of um, George Eliot's right hand or right arm being thicker than her left um, was squashed. And, and she, she, Catherine has done some absolutely fascinating research. But the reason I'm telling you, mentioning this, is that Catherine went on a course, um, a week <laughs> course, uh, in how to, you know, in dairy maid, in dairy, and being a dairy maid. And she was completely exhausted. Didn't finish the didn't finish the course because she'd had enough. Um, but one of the things that she said really was that it was such hard work, and that wherever wherever you went for a day or so afterwards, you, there was this smell around of uh, of the dairy. Um, <laughs> but it was just typically uh, Catherine that she tells stories like that so so well. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have got the chat option on, and you'll see. Uh, uh, lovely comment, thank you, from Rosemary Donaldson and uh, from Hemmings Bassett, greetings from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, uh, which is one of the great things about being able to do this, isn't it? Um, are there, is there anybody else who has a comment or a question? Um, for uh, there's actually a question from Ken Harris, which is up there, which I think is sent oh. to, to me rather than to the group. So as Ken writes, was the reaction to Adam be what she wanted? It hardly, seems, it hardly seems it could have been more enthusiastic, but was it something she was able to receive? Was she open to the fellowship or temperamentally prohibited from appreciating that reaction? And I think she would have been delighted at how popular the novel was. And we know that she was particularly appreciative of the review in Blackwood's magazine itself, which is a, which is a great review. I think she appreciated the one in the Times. Um, I think who wouldn't be delighted? I mean, we know that she was very sensitive to, to bad reviews and that Lewis tried to protect her from them. But I suppose your, your question about whether she was open to the fellowship is quite interesting because I suppose there's a way in which she still wasn't able to, to be that kind of publicly accepted into a broader fellowship of, of writers. So maybe it's that's the, the, the reviews or the ways in which she can participate in that network. Um, and though she couldn't physically go along to the writers' dinners and and um, social events. And Juliet's asking if, do we have any information on how the publishers of Romola promoted the novel as it wasn't very well received? I, I don't have information. I don't know if Joanne or John or John have any more information about that. Um, it's obviously published Certainly, by- Certainly, the, the thing about Romola surely was that it was published by George Smith, who did his damnedest to make it popular, um, but, um, wasn't you know wasn't successful and that was one of the reasons eventually um uh, that uh, brought Elliot back to John Blackwood so yeah. Romola is an anomalous I think in an otherwise increase story of greater and greater success mm -hmm. it's a very anomalous book in lots of ways isn't it mm. I was fascinated, Gail, by again by your talking of the uh, the publication of Adam Bede, um, uh, how how you brought out how skillful Lewis and George Eliot and Blackwood were in in organising the marketing of it. And we we tend to think of marketing as 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 a much more modern idea, but they they somehow they managed to to get it sewn up with Moody's. And I hadn't realized how powerful and influential Moody's were. Mm -hmm. Again, we tend to think of, of publishers having to um, almost pay Tesco's to stop their, you know, um, or, or, or Waterstones charging extra to publishers so that the books are on display. But it really, it, it, it was all going on in the 1850s too, wasn't it? There was this sort of uh, really complicated system of getting books out there and mm -hmm. getting public attention for them. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I mean, the, the fact that Judith Flanders cites that, that Moody's bought 100,000 books, I mean, and we, we know we've got millions of books coming out now, but even 100,000 books is quite difficult to kind of negotiate when you think about how few people would have had access to those books, being able to buy them or even read them. So it's, it's a very, it's a very big market even then. 
And that's only the books that came out as in, in novel form. Obviously, the, the newspapers and um, periodicals have all been producing their own fiction too. So fiction is a, is a massive, massive market at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John's got a comment, I think. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering on the subject of marketing, what effect, do we know what effect the two paintings that Queen Victoria commissioned of scenes from Adam Bede, mm -hmm. um, how they were received and whether that would have, you know, created a, a, an, another kind of uh, um, uh, range of readers or uh, another kind of range of interest at any rate in the book. I'm not sure, I can't remember John when they were done, it wasn't immediately was it? I suppose it wasn't, no, there would have been some time with lag and I'm yeah. not quite sure how, how long it is. Sorry? I think it was 1861. Okay. Oh, two years later. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. I don't yes, know. I mean, they were quite popular, weren't they? I think they were reproduced. Um, but I suppose that by that time, Adam Bede had established itself as a kind of modern classic, and so this would yeah. have confirmed rather than maybe yeah. reach new people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I mean, well onto Middle of the Floss and, and Silas Marner by then. Mm. Yeah. Anybody else with a with a hand up or a point to raise? David Pinkerson, I think. Uh, yes, I wondered whether uh, we have any information on these successful sales. Where how far was it a a countrywide success, a provincial success, a London metropolitan success, a city success, or? Is there any information about that kind of targeted information about sales? I don't know. We could, I mean, we've got the numbers of the sales for each edition, but I'm not sure. I mean, I, I haven't seen geographical distributions. I suppose what I would say is that the reviews are really well distributed. So a lot of the reviews I was looking at today were from um, local papers as well as, as London-based papers. But I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody else knows anything about the, the sales and how they were spread out. I, I, I'm not sure I've seen, that's a brilliant question, I haven't seen information about that. I'll, I'll try and find out, I'm now, I'm now intrigued by, by that. I, I suspect that 1859, um, it's a very mixed picture and there's a, a terrific, uh, there's still millions of people in, in provincial, rural, agricultural areas. Mm -hmm. But uh, read the technicalities of milk and butter making with great interest. Yeah, but I suppose you know the, the um, speech I quoted from from um, George Howard, which was to the, the workers in Saddleworth, suggesting that actually they might have access. I don't think that that's fanciful thinking on his part, but but certainly um, institutes, working men's institutes throughout the country would have been buying solid literature like Adam Bede for people to borrow so so certainly in, in places which had a significant body of population that, that actually could support something like a working men's institute we might suppose that they would have access to Adam Bede but perhaps deep in the country it might have been more difficult for people to get a hold of texts like that. Mm. That's a really interesting question. This isn't sort of helpful in terms of where in the country, but it's always pointed out that Blackwood honed a particular technique with Adam Bede of bringing out several three volume editions and then reducing it to a two volume edition which sold for 12 shillings instead of 31 and six, and then yeah. a six shilling edition. And that would have widened, I'd have thought, the readership yeah. substantially. Yeah. Anthea has just put a comment in the chat. She says, she says, I've been thinking a lot during your talk about network, web and fellowship and wonder how you see the impact of recent days on our understanding of these words. To what extent do you think openness and closed are relevant? And I suppose, I, I mean, partly, after, you know, having read Mary's book a while ago, the, the, the idea of the network has taken on a lot, um, much greater significance very recently. And I suppose it was I was kind of thinking about the more sinister aspects of it in having watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix recently. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It was the most terrifying thing, actually, about the ways in which 
and networked brains because we're so used to, to working on screens in particular networks that are being manipulated are actually it's actually changing the way we think but it did make me think about the ways in which um, some of the same fears were articulated about reading fiction in the 1850s and 1860s and how that was actually quite bad for you and it might kind of ruin you morally or make you a more frivolous person so I suppose there's, there's always been an anxiety about new technologies new forms of communication but um, ultimately I suppose I'd suggest that Elliot is, is getting us to engage with each other in ways which are less pernicious than Facebook these days but um, yeah it's a really interesting question Anthea I think it's you know these are terms which are accruing meaning the more we we continue with them.